Hi everyone, welcome to another Q&A on the Health Detective podcast and tonight we've got Dr Pete who is going to answer all our different questions about gout because he's an expert in a whole lot of metabolic disorders but gout is something that he has a lot of knowledge about so thanks for coming Dr Pete I know it's in the middle of the night where you are so I really appreciate you being here Thank you. I'm honored to be here, actually, and really excited um, to talk with your viewers and and with you. It's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. So while everybody is arriving and getting settled in, can we shall we start just by defining what gout is? Could you just give us a quick overview of gout and and what that what it actually is and and yeah. Would be a good place to start, I think. Gout is an inflammatory uh, disease, and it's related. Um, on the surface of it, when you when you hear about gout in general, um, it's talked about like it's this individualized sort of ailment that people can get, and usually it's associated. There's a lot of stigma with uh, associated with it. There, you know, the idea that. Um, somebody's uh, overeating and over drinking and doing this chronically, which may be true, but uh, that aspect of it. Um, but generally speaking, uh, people that suffer from gout um, are eating the standard American diet. Alcohol may be part of it. It's a systemic inflammatory uh, condition that involves the joints and uric acid is uh, central to a gout flare, um, but there are some myths about it. One of the myths is that uh, uric acid rises in the circulatory system, it diffuses in, into the joint where it crystallizes and then you have the gout flare. That basic hypothesis is incorrect. Um, and Instead, rather, we have specialized cells that are in the joint, the chondrocytes, that are responsible for maintaining the health, uh, a healthy joint. And on the standard American diet, uh, we have a situation where those cells are chronically inflamed. So there's, there's low-grade inflammation. And then we have... Uh, the introduction of what I call the deadly triad, uh, which is going to push the, those conditions over the edge. The deadly triad being a large quantity of alcohol, a large quantity of glucose, so hyperglycemic event, along with uh, fructose. And it's the fructose metabolism that happens in the chondrocyte that causes a sudden acute rise in uric acid. The chondrocyte uh, is inflamed to start with. Um, it makes the chondrocytes sick, and then you have uh, recruitment of the innate immune system. And uh, between the monosodium urate crystals, the innate immune system, and the, the sickening condition of the chondrocyte, you have the conditions there where a gout flare can happen. Um, Everything I'm talking about is a hypothesis. Uh, I recently, if you review Dr. Richard Johnson's work, which goes back decades, um, the hypothesis is consistent with his data, the fructose uric acid model of diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, uh, and by extension, gout. Um, and it makes, when you think about gout this way, um, it basically makes sense with all the data. Um, the standard hypothesis I say is incorrect because when even, even if all you do is you look at the statistical data in regard to gout, um, there are, are lots of inconsistencies with it. Um, but anyway, I maybe I should stop there and, and see if I answered your question or if there's more that 
Yeah, there's more questions coming in. So I'll just remind everybody, if you have questions and if you're unsure of anything that Dr. Peach is explaining, please just send your questions through the, to the chat and, and we will um, get him to elaborate on them and explain them a little bit more. So a question that's just come in is what are the first symptoms of gout? I've got some pain in my hands that come and go. Could that be gout? Generally speaking, uh, that's a really good question and the viewer might not like my answer. Um, generally speaking, uh, the gout flare is very specific. Uh, usually it's in the joint of the big toe, um, one or the other. It tends to reoccur in the same joint. It can happen. It, it can <clears throat> actually happen in the hands, but that's more rare than, than the situation with, uh, with the main toe joint or knees. It seems to be if I was going to rank these in order of which it's most likely, it would be the toe joint, the knee, and then potentially hands or other uh, other other joints. But gout generally is a, is a very specifically oriented pain. In other words, like, um, uh, and I don't have a lot of experience with this, but but I was a rock climber for many many years, and the general sort of arthritis I have with that's resulting in my fingers like, like I'm in my 60s now. Um, it's not the same. You know, the, arth arth the general osteoarthritic issue is more generalized. Um, with gout, it's like someone drove a nail right through a particular joint and you don't generally have pain anywhere else except in that that's specific cool. location. And is there a reason that it tends to be in the big toe? Why would that be the joint that's most affected? I don't think that there's a, a good solid answer for that. One of the um, explanations that I've seen for, the, for this is that um, the, the toe joints are far away from the circulatory system. Um, so, and, and so usually this thing happens at night. Um, and there could be a potential uh, temperature effect here. The fact that in the extremities, the, the, uh, the temperature is going to be a little lower. And this has the reason the, the temperature may be important is because uh, sodium urate or uric acid from, for, on, on the simplest level, its solubility, in other words, its uh, propensity to form a crystal or a solid is uh, very sensitive to temperature. So when you lower the temperature, it's much easier for the uric acid to form a, a crystal. That's one argument uh, for this. Um, it's not the best argument. Um, it's a, that's why it's a really, really good question. Um, but generally speaking, that's why the this is the argument that, that has been given for the reason why it's in the toe joint. But um, I don't think there's any reason why it couldn't be in a finger, um, in a finger joint. So um, I think this is somewhat individualized. Next question is how do you test for uric acid? So is that a simple blood test? And, what, and, and if so, what does that tell us? So you can easily test for uric acid with a handheld meter. Um, this is the ure sure meter. I, I'm not trying to promote a meter, but three years ago when I got started with the whole gout thing, because I, I was, had gone onto the ketogenic diet, the first thing I wanted to do was have a way of measuring my uric acid um, so I could track it. Uh, and the Eurasure was the only meter on the market at that point. Now I know that there are others. Um, if you go on Amazon or search around in the internet, there are other companies now that are making these meters. 
So you can pick one up just like a glucose ketone meter. And, and um, but so here's a couple things. You need to recognize when you're measuring uric acid by finger sticking, or you go into a laboratory and have the blood work done, you are measuring extracellular uric acid that is in the circulatory system. And there's a difference between extracellular uric acid and the hypothesis that I'm talking with you guys tonight about uh, is, is uh, centered on intracellular uric acid, what's going on inside the cell. If, if we were talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, for example, relative to Johnson's work, we would be talking about the sudden acute rise in uric acid that happens inside a liver cell, which makes the liver cell essentially sick and has a whole cascade of results or, or um, outcomes uh, that are similar actually to what I think is going on in the chondrocyte inside the joint. Uh, and this is intracellular uric acid. And, and so, so can we tell the difference? Because I mean, we have that problem measuring so many things with blood tests, don't we? We're measuring, you know, what's in the serum or what, you know, what's in the plasma, but we're not actually measuring what's actually in the cell. And so that's one of the drawbacks drawbacks of blood testing. Yes, it is because especially with the situation with gout, um, it really illustrates the fact that in different organs and the different cells that are in these organs, they have different metabolic requirements. The, so looking at things from the point of view of what's happening in the circulatory system uh, has its problems because the, what measuring uh, extracellular uric acid does for us is it allows us to, to figure out what our patterns are in general, like how much uric acid is, is being processed by different organs and showing up in the circulatory system. Yeah. And so things like fasting uric acid, you can learn what your patterns are with that. Uh, fasting uric acid tends to be higher than uh, um, your uric acid, say in the late afternoon, there's a, there's a um, circadian rhythm to it. Um, you have the capabilities and the, and liver, since I sort of opened that can of worms, the, the liver is the main organ responsible for modulating uric acid in a human. Um, but what you have to keep in mind is that your, you, this metabolism, this fructose metabolism has been confirmed and is active in brain, um, in the liver. Uh, I believe it's active in the chondrocyte, but hopefully down the road, there'll be data to confirm that or deny that or whatever. Um, also, what am I forgetting? Um, let's see, brain, liver, skeletal, muscle, adipose tissue. Um, uric acid, I think as time goes on, I think this fructose metabolism is gonna be confirmed in most, if not all tissue types. The, the issue is gonna be probably down the road. Um, to what extent is that pathway being activated, right? Because in human evolution, we, we evolved this pathway about 24 million years ago, or we optimized it at any rate when we lost the capability to break down uric acid. Um, so that means that all the cells in our body have the capability for fructose metabolism. The question is, are they doing it? Because different organs have different purposes and therefore you know, the metabolic pathways that, that are optimized in a liver versus a chondrocyte are going to be, you know, there's going to be nuances. Yeah. They're not going to be, it's not going to be identical. Mm. Um, I've got a question. Is it possible to have uric acid blood test? Oh, is it possible to have a uric acid blood test in the normal range and also have gout? Yes, it is. And, and that's one of the fundamental reasons why the standard hypothesis of gout is incorrect. 
Um, the argument goes, if you have high uric acid, you're at high risk for gout. There's a high, high probability um, if you have more uh, uric acid circulating, uh, uh, the threshold's around seven migs per deciliter. If you have that value or, or more that you're running a high risk of, of gout, a uh, high risk of crystallization in a joint. Truth of the matter is, is about 14% of gout sufferers have uric acid values that are between um, six and eight. The reference range goes from four to eight. And uh, a significant number have gout flares that are under six. I think it was 14%, uh, 14 or 18. Anyway, it's a high percentage. And, and I can attest myself in N1, when I uh, went on allopurinol, and this was a while ago, I had a, a gout flare, the same big toe that where I've had gout before. And the uric acid, my circulating uric acid was 4.5 mg per deciliter. So yeah, you can, you can have a gout flare with perfectly normal um, levels of, of uric acid, which arguably, um, well, so basically that is one of the reasons, it's one of many reasons why I don't think the hypothesis is correct. So that might lead on to the next question, which is my doctor told me to stop eating high purine foods. Will that fix my gout and what are they? Okay, so um, here's what the situation is. Uh, there's lots, there's lots of nutritional things that can coalesce into a gout flare. But uh, I think the data is solid uh, for the following conditions. Well, I call it the deadly triad. So again, I'm going to reiterate, gout flares may, when someone has a gout flare, it may seem like to them that this came out of nowhere, you know, just like somebody threw a rock and hit you in the head. It just you didn't know it was coming and blam, you got hit with this thing. So what happened last night? Did I eat, was it the anchovies I ate? Was it a sardine? So, and this is mainly what we hear about, you know, when you look at the surface of the internet, it's like someone's probably eating a, a high purine protein. So here's the, here's the thing about this though. Number one, we have the systemic Low-grade inflammation, I believe, in the joint, in the chondrocyte. There, and there's a ton of osteoarthritic data in this area, right? Osteoarthritis is not gout, but, but in order to try and understand this condition, you have to be willing to look outside the lens of just the gout research. That's how I found my way to, to Johnson's work. Um, and... What, what the osteoarthritis area is doing is they're looking at the conditions that lead to this low-grade inflammation of the chondrocyte in the joint. And they're finding unequivocally that hyperglycemia, which is a major uh, attribute of the standard American diet, has a central role to play in this. So I, what I call the deadly triad, I believe is necessary to push the chondrocyte over the edge and to generate a gout flare. And that triad is alcohol eaten at the same time as a hyperglycemic meal uh, that has added sugars in it so that you're getting the fructose. So A number one, if you, if you have, you're having problems with gout, uh, the first thing to get eliminated off the top is to, to stop having the alcohol Make sure you're not eating meals that are high in uh, glucose, you know, the rice, the pasta, yada, yada down the road. And then you've got to stop the sugar. And the, that pushes back heavily on the processed food that can have the added sugars or any other way that you're bringing sugar or high fructose corn syrup into your life. Now, with that out of the way, then secondary to that are high uric acid foods of which protein arguably is, is the major issue here. But 
what what I have found and others, and this is N1. This so in other words, you can take what I'm going to say with a grain of salt. I believe unless you're abusing some type of protein, uh, that you know you you can eat. Uh, how, how do I say this? Uh, I, I've been on the ketogenic diet for almost four years now, and I'm eating about 20% protein. And it's very, you know, I'm eating chicken, beef, uh, lamb, uh, pork, and so on, right? I try not to uh, um, eat specifically one or the other of those. And occasionally I'm still having you know, like I, I went on a backpacking trip recently and, um, and I had some anchovies, right? But, uh, and, and these are, you know, the anchovy thing, uh, the sardines, I'm sure there's things in, in being midnight that I'm not thinking of right off, the, off the top of my head, but, oh, oh, and this is where beer is really a big problem if you're a beer drinker, because um, Beer is really a double whammy. In fact, it's a triple whammy because most beers are going to be really high in carbohydrate, the glucose. And then you've got a high purine load because they made the beer from yeast. And so you've got all of the, you know, the DNA and the RNA from that and all those kinds of things. And so beer uh, has quite a high uh, purine load associated with it. So uh, what I usually tell th with my clients and the people who, who, because this question gets asked a lot is like, unless you're sitting down and eating, you know, tins of sardines and at the same time having beer with it, I, I honestly don't think that um, I'm going to use this word, but it's probably incorrect to really do it. But I don't think that eating a normal load of protein As is the where the problem is. Mm -hmm. I don't. I've just had another comment, it's, which says, I used to blame the glass of red wine and steak, but now I think it was probably the banana I had for breakfast, the apple I had for lunch, and the potatoes on my dinner plate. Exactly. Uh, uh, I think that this is a complex thing. Uh, D uh, Robert Lustig, Dr. Lustig has written a lot about this, and I have since myself gone to talking about the, this issue from the point of view of the deadly triad. But if we back away out of the joint for a minute, we think about what's going on with the liver because, and this is something important for the viewers to understand. Uh, if you are suffering from gout, the likelihood that you're not suffering from uh, one of these other comorbidities uh, that's As being driven, driven to the central level, level by uh, insulin resistance, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, metabolic sin is really slim. Mm -hmm. And um, when you read Lustig's work, he, he really emphasizes the fact that at the level of the liver, you're dealing with this concept of simultaneous excess calories. In a very short period of time, you have hyperglycemia, you have the alcohol and you have the fructose and it's overwhelming the liver, the fructose with, with the sudden acute rise that it causes in, in the uric acid. And then what the reason I keep harping on the hyperglycemia is because it activates this metabolic pathway called polyol. And, uh, and the reason that it does that is because you have this massive load of glucose is sitting at the head of the pathway that processes it, the glycolysis. And uh, in the cell, basically you want to get rid of that glucose. And so uh, it is funneled off in the polyol pathway and produces endogenous fructose. Uh, up to 30% of that glucose pool is sitting there, is going to be pumped into the polyol pathway and the outcome being the endogenous fructose. So this is why hyperglycemia uh, is one of the major aspects of, of people that are suffering from gout is because you're generating the fructose that way. And then once you have it, you get the sudden acute rise in uric acid and that's driving the sickness in the chondrocyte. It's also driving the systemic inflammation, the disruption with um, the nitric oxide pathway in the liver and the insulin resistance is coming out of that, out of all that. Uh, it's making the liver sick. I mean, you're generating 
uh, oil droplets in the liver and the whole triglyceride thing. Uh, so chronic hyperglycemia is not, is not a good thing. And, um, and so that's why I keep emphasizing it. And then the, the other part of that is when you look at the um, osteoarthritis data, it's just massive there. And uh, I had a, an interview um, very recently again with Dr. Richard Johnson, and we talked about the fact that there's so much data in terms of hyperglycemia and the effect that it's having on the chondrocyte. And, and very few of those researchers have bothered yet to test for the fructose enzymes in the chondrocyte. There's one paper uh, that I found uh, that looked at or asked the question, is the polyol pathway activated in the chondrocyte? And the answer is yes, it is. Mm, mm, very interesting. So what would you recommend to people in terms of good blood sugar management? What sort of reference ranges would you be looking at? So um, let me clarify your question. Uh, so the fact is, if you have gout, the likelihood that you are also pre-diabetic or diabetic, or you've got um, other hypertensive, you know, your high blood pressure, or there's cardiovascular issues are really slim. So the first thing I tell people that are suffering from gout and they want to, they want to do something proactive about this is that they need to have more blood work done and they need to find out what their metabolic condition is. You know, they need to know. Um, we we really can't... struggle with we really struggle with that in New Zealand. You can get HbA1c done. You can get a fasting glucose. Trying to get insulin or C peptide anything to measure anything to measure insulin resistance is um, very difficult, and you tend to get attacked by your GP for even asking. And then the levels are so high. You know, um, they're not. You know, the ranges are so extended that people get told, oh, there's nothing wrong, you're fine, off you go. Uh, so I just, yeah, so I was just wondering what your, not to interrupt about the blood work, but just wondering, you know, if you had some guidelines about what people should be looking for with, with blood glucose and insulin. Well, the glucose, uh, glucose and uric acid are not, I mean, I think that they are related, but they're not related in the way people think. I mean, if you have high uric acid, doesn't mean you're going to have high okay. glucose. But the glucose range, um, and I think you guys do the millimolar, the glucose yeah. range should be between 66 and 99. Right. So that's sort of under, under six here, I think. 5.6 or something like that. Uh, let's see, 66. Um, so on the low end, 3.6 millimolar, and on the high end, five point five. So their glucose should be between 3.6 and 5.5. And I prefer in myself that I'm in the mid eighties. So that's going to be. I, I tend to use, I, I tend to use between about 4.2 to 4.9 is what, okay. you know, yeah, as, as, as kind of where I've been taught with that in the functional medicine program. Yeah. yeah. And, and uric acid should be between uh, four and eight. When you really push on this, and I, I, and I, and I have in conversations with Dr. Johnson, um, I think when you really push on it with him, he's going to say that your uric acid should be between four and five mg per deciliter um, mm. in, in the normal range. Now, if you're suffering from gout, uh, my, my approach to putting it in remission is to go on a ketogenic lifestyle. Uh, I advocate for uh, no more than 50 grams of total carbs per day. Um, and 
you know, you elevate the fat and so on. It takes a while to get keto adapted. Um, I think more and more there's there's arguments about this length of time, but it generally is going to be, you know, on average around three months. It can be longer. I'm in my 60s. And when I keto adapted it, it I think I was a full year in that process. Um, and there's more and more of the sciences coming out and because of the profound changes that happen that that support that, that it takes a long time to really, I mean, if you've been eating the standard American diet your whole life, like I was, and and then you have a beer habit on top of it, which I did, um, you can't expect keto adaption is gonna happen overnight. And the reason why the keto adaption is important is because uh, it, the ketogenic diet functions to lower systemic inflammation. So going, going back to what's happening in the joint, you really need that low grade inflammation to go away. And the, the circulatory system is not so good for our joints. So everything that's happening with the joints is gonna take longer, say, than you would expect for you know, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver to reverse in a liver, right? That's going to be faster than, mm -hmm. than what's going on with your joints because the circulatory system, the immune system, all that stuff is going to be operating slower there. The one, the one uh, challenge that we face when we go on to the ketogenic diet as a gout sufferer is that at least initially, your extracellular uric acid is going to rise substantially. And the reason why that happens is because when people go onto the ketogenic diet, the, their ketones tend to, if they do a good job and they really cut the carbs and we, we cut through all of the shenanigans that we hear about out there and like all of the sugar and all the alcohol is stopped for real. And then we really do cut into the carbs, right? We're not like having cheat days and doing all this business then what happens is those ketones are going to come up pretty fast, right? To usually pretty high levels. And uh, these are organic acids and they compete for excretion at the level of the kidney with the uric acid. So you, you see a uric acid spike at the beginning of the ketogenic uh, wow. diet. Yep. And um, this is another reason why people should get, the, get a, um, a finger finger sticking unit and measure their uric acid because they can track the spike. Yeah. And this is when they're vulnerable to a gout flare. You know, once they get keto adapted, um, the, the flares will come down. It comes back down. Yeah. And now where it comes back down to is there's not good science on this and it's an argument right now. And so I'm, what I'm going to say there, I don't have anything to back up. It's my gut just talking to people that have done this uh, um, uh, themselves like, like myself. And so it seems like that people that are significantly overweight and also type two diabetic, when, when they get keto adapted and they start bringing a lot of weight down and they see uh, that they go through the uric acid spike. When the uric acid comes down for, for this group of individuals, the uric acid seems to come down well into the reference range, right? But then you have other, other, this other group like me who, who were not significantly overweight to start with. We, we're like the lean, these lean people that are sick, metabolically not well. The thin on the and, outside, fat on the inside, people. Exactly. And so in like, for, I'll just focus on me. I, I went through my uric acid spike. And then when it came down, it settled at the top of the range. Hmm. Uh, between seven and eight migs per, of, of uric acid per deciliter. And it just seems to be stuck there forever. Um, and, and so people tend to fall into these two groups. And you know, there's no way to know where you're going to fall, but, and being hyperuricemic, the frustration with that is that there's no, there's no good explanation for it. Um, nobody actually knows whether it's safe uh, to be running uric acid at that level. Um, and nobody knows, 
you know, they, they don't know about the safety level of it. Um, because you have in the background, you have this is issue around cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease that's hanging out there. And, um, and even if you pigeonhole guys like Dr. Richard um, or Dr. Sivas, um, he, in, a, in an interview with me in a discussion, um, he admitted, we don't know if having a uric acid a, at seven mg per deciliter is safe or not. Um, does it mean you're gonna you're at risk of a cardiovascular event down the road? Um, the, the problem with extracellular uric acid is we just don't understand the concept of thresholds, right? We know that uric acid in the extracellular environment in the circulatory system, it has a very important antioxidant effect. But, but where is, is that effect? Uh, where, where's the threshold for that? How much is too much uric acid? And that question is unknown, along with, along with the other functions of uric acid, like what is it doing in the circulatory system? You know, we know a lot more about what it does inside cells, inside a liver cell. And I think in the future, we're going to know a lot more about what it's doing inside a chondrocyte. Um, so I feel a lot more comfortable when we talk about what's going on inside organs with this than when we're talking about the circulatory system. All right, so a couple more questions. So a, a comment, you know, we were talking about the blood testing. So one person has commented that during 22 years of being a type two diabetic and having metabolic mayhem, She's had uric acid tested once and she can get an HbA1c done annually. So that's the state of New Zealand diabetes care. Shock. I think that that's really common for the US too. Um, I think it's easier, it sounds like from speaking with you that it's easier here to mm. get to request these tests. Like we have ways that we can go outside the system now and we can contract blood work ourselves um, and they'll have a staff doctor that will okay our stuff. And um, so I appreciate the problem. If I, you know, when I was first diagnosed with diabetes or a pre-diabetes um, and I went to my doctor, um, it, it wasn't that different. I mean, they, all, they measured almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And, and I didn't, that was one of the frustrations of, of being chronically ill is uh, as I progressed with my learning, which didn't come from the medical establishment, right? Then, then I sorted out, oh my God, how, how can I be making dis decisions about my health if, if I don't know more? I need to know more, right? So I appreciate the, the frustration and the um, and then not knowing, I think even the, but I think in Australia, you can get handheld meters. I think like, especially with uric acid, if you think that there's an issue going on or you suspect it, um, I think you can uh, get these through Amazon now and so on, and you can measure your uric acid yourself. And at the very least, you can take that data to the doctor and say, mm -hmm. here, look, uh, that's well, what I've done now with my uric acid. Um, I I'll, keep I'll look on. into that. Mm. Yeah, mm. So there's my data. Right. Yeah, that's that's really great. I, I, I mean, book. I know we're talking about gout, but I get really frustrated with the diagnostic criteria for diabetes, and I really hate this term pre-diabetes because if you're pre-diabetic, you're basically a diabetic, and I think yeah. you know. Maybe we should call it stage one, stage two, and stage three when it's advanced or something like that, you know. But I think we I think we need to rename it so that we give it appropriate significance. Because people say, Oh, I'm pre-diabetic. Oh, yay. And I'm like, you no, know, you're a diabetic if you've got if you've got pre-diabetes. You just don't have the high, you just don't have the elevated blood sugars out of the doctor's ranges yet, you know. Exactly. And that, and that's just one of the factors that, you know, that the doctor ought to be um, looking at. I mean, there's the whole issue with the lipids and so on. And, 
And uh, I remember the doctor I had when I was diagnosed as being pre-diabetic, they were like, well, get more exercise and, and eat better. And we'll, let's take a look at these numbers a, a year from now. And it's like, what? <laughs> mm. Mm. Yeah. I just think it's completely crazy. I mean, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And that brings up exercise. There's a question here. Should I exercise with gout? Uh, absolutely. So here's the thing. Exercise does cause uric acid to rise, but you got to remember, we, we evolved, humans evolved to have uric acid um, at a certain level. My, my only argument with the doctors is, what is the level? What should it be? And no, we don't have a good answer for that, but we know that we have to have it. It, it carries a very important function inside cells. And I believe also on an extracellular level, and it does go up. It does go up with exercise and you can rank it um, under in high intensity exercise. Uh, the uric acid is going to rise the most because, you know, you, you've thrown fate to the wind and you're hammering on whatever it is you're doing and you're maximizing, uh, you know, the, the threshold of your muscles and all that. And you're going to see an acute uric acid rise that happens pretty closely with the exercise. Like you can measure this within 30 minutes of the exercise, your, your uric acid is going to be spiking. Next, um, is that's followed by the strength training. And then lastly, just general movement. Uh, and all of this, the reason I can talk about it is because I've measured this stuff extensively in myself. Um, you get one of those meters. I'm testing uric acid all the time. I'm still testing it uh, these days, right? Like if I have a new food, someone was asking earlier, what foods can you eat? Um, the power of measuring this yourself allows you to answer that question. You want to have sardines? Have some sardines. Measure your uric acid before you eat them. And then measure your uric acid after eating them at 30 minutes, one hour, and two hours, and you're going to have your answer right there. How, how, how that particular food item affects your uric acid. You can do the same thing with exercise. So, but I don't let me get lost. The answer to the, to the exercise question is yes. Why? Because we need to improve our mitochondria and we need to improve the efficiency of our cardiovascular system. That's imperative to us being able to reverse chronic disease, right? I mean, most, when you boil all this business down, even gout, it points uh, at the mitochondria, the issues surrounding the mitochondria at the level of the liver and the muscle tissue, in the brain, especially with like Alzheimer's where there's a substantial fructose metabolism. And if you're not exercising, you're, you're not oh. enhancing mm -hmm. the function or the biogenesis of, of mitochondria. And I believe that's, it's a big mistake. It all comes down to energy production, doesn't it? Like every cell yeah. needs to be able to produce energy. And if, we, if we're not producing energy, we get sick and die. Exactly. And there's a really strong relationship between the metabolic pathways that the mitochondria is, is uh, responsible for and the metabolic pathways that are, that are um, going on, you know, in the cytoplasm of the cell. And the cytoplasm, to keep things simple, the cytoplasm and the mitochondria are talking all the time. Mm -hmm. And if the mitochondria is sick or, and or you've got issues uh, in the level of the cytoplasm as well, like you do when you have sudden acute rises in uric acid. Uh, you know, we know what the outcome is. The, the diabetes is waiting, the cardiovascular disease and so on, and a gout flare. I mean, that's, that's just waiting at the end of the hallway. So is one of the benefits of uric acid at acting as an antioxidant? Is that, is that one of its purposes? Absolutely. And um, the literature says that the antioxidant effect in our, in our, you know, extracellular environment is, uh, 
you can put 50% of the responsibility for that on uric acid. Mm. They mm. attribute it to that. It, millions of years ago, 24 million years ago, when, when the last of the mutations knocked out our ability to, um, um, to degrade uric acid, we also lost the capability to uh, produce vitamin C. Mm. Mm. At the same time, we also, rel at the same relative time, this is interesting, we also uh, had a mutation uh, about 10 million years ago that allowed us to process alcohol 40-fold uh, more efficiently than we could prior to that. So you had all of these, you had all of these mutations happening about around the same same time period uh, that I think have really massive consequences for us now um, be, because of the way that we're, because of the way that we eat, yeah. the food environment and yeah. other aspects, obviously, you know, the mm -hmm. exercise, sleep, stress, mm -hmm. all that business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was a question I missed somewhere. Oh, will increasing my fiber help with my gout um, someone's doctor told them to increase their fiber okay so on the surface of it if you step all the way out of the low carb uh, lifestyle and you step all the way back to the viewpoint of people like lustig and uh, dr richard johnson uh, uh, perlmutter all of these guys, right? They're all doctors and they're, they're not advocating any sort of like um, um, specialized ways of eating. What they're gonna argue to you is that, okay, we, we have to have fiber, all right? And I understand this argument and I think it's a good argument where it can get us into trouble because I believe that we really need to lower the carbs is that the fiber argument can be used in order for somebody to come back into this and say, all right, so I'm still going to have my fruit. I'm still going to have, you know, I'm still going to be able to eat this and that as a way of, of, of being able to, to keep carbohydrates in their lifestyle. And so I hesitate when I'm asked about the fiber. I, I need to, to be certain that I don't believe giving permission to eat the car carbohydrates is, I, I would say with someone asking me that, is that what you're asking me? Yeah, do you want or to? Or are you asking me whether fiber is good for you? Because the fiber, of course it's good, right? But the, the question that they really need to be asking is, you know, what is my condition? And what am I trying to solve here metabolically? Because, I mean, I think if you want to put gout in remission, the best way to do it is to get down to 50 grams of total carbs per day. And arguably, that's not going to have a lot of, of what people consider fiber in it. Um, now, the question becomes down the road. Once you've sorted out that you can get gout remission you, and you can reverse your diabetes. You, you do all that. You take the requisite amount of time. And then there are probably nuances, right? We're all individuals here sorting out, you know, oh, I actually, it turns out I can eat a little bit of this and I can eat a little bit of that. Once you've reversed these conditions, you've got gout in remission. You know, I think it's reasonable to start experimenting with different foods that may have a bigger fiber load in them. But as I say that, you've got to understand out there that you've got a certain amount of carb tolerance or intolerance. I mean, it depends how you want to look at the term. Um, and that is unique to you. And uh, sorting out where you are with that requires that you be careful because what one thing we do know about this lifestyle is that if you go back, say you cure yourself. I, I know I just used a careless word there, but say you reverse your diabetes and your gout is in remission. 
And then you go back to eating the way you were before, well, you're probably gonna end up with a gout flare and your diabetes is gonna come roaring back. That's my view about that. I really love that you talked about the carb tolerance because that's something I talk about a lot. So rather than blaming people for you know, their lifestyle and their food choices, I explain it as, you've got your individual ability to tolerate those foods and that's different from somebody else's and you need to find your own level and what works for you and what what your safe level of those foods is uh <laughs> whatever whatever the language is rather than you know just hammering at people about you know poor food choices all the time and things like that yeah, I think it's kind of, sometimes I feel like what we're doing is all of us on an individual basis is we're sorting around for a needle in a haystack. Um, you know, one thing that I've learned over the last uh, three and a half years now is that um, this life, we're, this is not a pill. That's the, I think that's the first lesson that you get when after you come away with the gout Mm -hmm. diagnosis and pre-diabetes and lord knows what else is in there it's like and lustig talks about this that this is not druggable mm -hmm. and the choices we make on a nutritional level um there are no silver bullets mm -hmm. we sort it and um and this goes back to um we talked about this earlier biomarker monitoring you know if you can track your glucose yourself the there's continuous glucose monitors out there now, or you can finger stick, that's what I do. Um, you can measure ketones, you can measure uric acid. So I believe take control. Yeah, Those are at know. least three things that are major markers that you measure them yourself. You can test foods, you can measure before you eat and then after you eat, which is, I, I do that fairly religiously. I mean, now three and a half years in, do I have, do I do that anymore after every meal? I'm absolutely not. But sometimes if I go to a restaurant, I've not been to that restaurant before. And my wife and I, you know, we have a nice dinner or whatever, and I do my best to eat low carb, but it's like, I don't, I can't say for sure. So I get home from the restaurant and I finger stick my glucose and my ketones. And they, that tells the truth right there. And then you know, after that, uh, that restaurant, it worked. And the next time I go there, I know I can at least order what I ordered and it's not going to like, you know, decimate me. Yeah. So, you know, take control is what I believe. Um, so you can at least make the best educated decisions that you can, you know. And, and taking control of your own health. Um, I have tofus. What can I do about that? I'm having kidney stones now. Is that from gout? Okay, there's a lot of reasons why you could be having kidney stones. Uh, and not all kidney stones are the same. Um, uh, they can be phosphate crystals. They can be oxalate crystals. And they can be, yes, uric acid, um, uh, urate crystals. Um, so... The answer is kind of yes, and I have to hedge it because like I just got done saying, there can be at least three different classes of, of crystals. So which one are you? I don't know, right? That, that's like when I said about the needle in the haystack, that's something that has to be sorted. What I do know is that, that um, those crystals are diet oriented for sure, right? That's a for sure thing. So, um, and I believe going low carb is what I would do in that case. Um, did I hear you ask about TOFI too? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is trickier. Um, I, I admitted to your audience that, that I'm on all up here and all, and, and I'm, I need to talk about that a little bit because, um, after you have gotten keto adapted, I went three years actually not on all of Purinol. And I finally made the decision to go on it 
because I could not get in my diet, I could not get my uric acid to come down below seven mg per deciliter. And I got scared I, doing the research that I'm doing and talking to guys like Johnson all the time and, and so on. I'm like, okay, I can't take this anymore. This potential cardiovascular risk thing yeah. out there. So I went on to um, all up here and all. Now, why am I bringing this up? Because there's solid research out there. I don't mean like epidemiological stuff. I mean, there are some solid clinical studies that have shown that if you go on an all um, on a ur urate lowering drug, you can get the tofi tofi to go away. Now, again, I need to warn the audience: you're not. This is not. Even though it's a pill, I take this pill. This is not something that happens overnight. Tofi are going to take a while to go away. And the other thing, which I can attest to you directly, when you go on a urate lowering drug, you can have a gout flare. And in fact, after I keto adapted, got gout remission, no problems with gout. I go on all of Purinol and what happens? Gout flare. And this, this is another piece of evidence that comes back to the standard hypothesis of gout that's out there. And the reason I disagree with it is because when I had the, the flare on all of Purinol, I, my, my uric acid was 4.5 mg per deciliter. So I believe that you've got this um, equilibrium. Uh, how, do, how do I, there, you have a relationship between crystalline uric acid in the joint the uric acid production that's going on in the cell, which is rising and falling on a natural level, when it rises too high, it's going to be uh, excreted into or secreted, one, one of the two. Uh, it's going to be pushed into the synovial fluid. And as that uric acid comes into the fluid, it's going to be uh, in a relationship with the crystallized uric acid. So when you go on all of all, what's going to happen is that the level of crystallized uric acid that's in the joint is going to change. It's going to, some of it is going to start dissolving out into, this, into the synovial fluid. Why? Because the, the uric acid in the circulatory system is dropping. And all, all of these different sources of uric acid have to equilibrize. They, they have to they're in, an, they're in a, a, a very uh, tight relationship and you cannot change one, one source of uric acid somewhere without all the others changing. So the reason why there's an effect on TOFI is because when you take a urate lowering drug, it drops the, the extracellular uric acid and the uric acid that is crystallized in the joint or in a TOFI must respond to that. It doesn't have a choice. This is thermodynamics, right? And thermodynamics rules. So there's gonna be a shift and some of the uric acid that is in the tophi is gonna to solubilize and it's gonna move out into the extracellular environment. So if you stay on the urate lowering drug long enough, eventually the tophi should dissolve. And honestly, I can tell you that I've seen some of this in myself. I, I had these knobs on both of my big toes, uh, a bigger one, <coughs> excuse me, on, on my gout toe. And those knobs have gone down. That's a good thing. Mm. Like they've gotten smaller, literally. But, th but that's taken like, you know, like around six months or something yeah. for that to happen. But the other side of this coin is that I've had more issues with gout since I've been on all of Purinol. So none, none of this is like, you know, it, it brings me, it's, it brings, it's like a full circle. It brings me back to the fact that maybe I should have just left the whole darn thing alone after I got remission on in the low carb lifestyle and, and just live with the fact that I had the seven mix per deciliter of of uric acid on average. So, you know, I know out there that there are some people that are really suffering with the TOFI, like they've got disfigured joints and everything like that. 
Um, and I think in a case like that, given what the literature says, I definitely would try uh, urate lowering drugs if it was my decision. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not giving advice. I'm just saying, if that was me, I'd be like, all right, I'm going to try this. Just realize that if that if one tries that, that you've got to be in on the for the long haul. It's not like you're going to go get take all of all for a month and that's going to take care of everything. And then and then you can not take all of all again. I mean, you're going to have to be on this thing for a while. And yeah. All right, we're just about at time. So I've got two questions. You sort of covered one really, what are the long-term implications of gout? Maybe we could just summarize those really quickly. Can you ask me that again? I'm sorry. Um, what are the long-term implications of gout? You, we, we have been over those a bit tonight, but could you just summarize those? Well, the long-term implications is like once you get a gout flare and and um, and you're aging, uh, they become more prevalent. Um, so if you don't do anything about the way the way that you're eating, especially with the deadly triad, I, I believe eliminating the alcohol, the sugar, and processed food is like that has to be done. Um, and and I don't say that. Uh, tri from a trivial perspective here, because, uh, and I don't want to go off on a tangent, but I think um, Susan probably agrees with this. You can give your viewpoint in a minute, but I, but we think that sugar addiction is really a massive issue out there. Uh, my experience as a coach has been everyone that I've worked with has had a lot of difficulty giving up their go-to high carbohydrate sugary foods without saying. Um, and the problem with gout, and I, I found this uh, to, to be super true, uh, especially with my followers, is that there's a ton of them that are drinking alcohol and they have the sugar. Mm -hmm. And we know that alcohol is addictive. So for gout sufferers, this, this is like a double whammy for them. They've got to give up alcohol and they've got to give up sugar. And that may be problematic. A guy might have to get, reach out and get help, right? To do that, to support networks and things like that. Um, I think the likelihood that a gout sufferer is, um, like I said earlier, is not also suffering from uh, diabetic complications or, or cardiovascular inflammatory issues there. Um, is really slim. So I think if you don't do anything about the gout, you're probably also not doing something about m metabolic conditions, which are a lot more serious than you think. Yeah. So I think being proactive and eliminating the sugar and the alcohol is the first step is a really good, and the processed food is a really good place to start um, um, and see what happens, see what happens. You know, I think there are some people out there that are pre-diabetic, for example, that could just eliminate the alcohol, the sugar, and the processed food, and they may see an improvement to the degree that they don't have to go to the next level, mm -hmm. but they've got to be realistic about it, and they need to be, you know, and like Susan said, I mean, there are other food issues, too, uh, hidden in all of this stuff, right? Maybe you can't eat, I, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm not sure what, I would just be making it up, but Maybe there are some foods, once you've eliminated the sugar, the processed food and the alcohol that are still causing inflammation and you're gonna have to sort that out. You know, maybe it's dairy. You know, maybe you're gonna have to seed like oils. dairy. Seed oils are a classic example. Getting, seed, yeah. yeah, the vegetable oils. Mm. So, you mm -hmm. know, and then once you've looked at that, then maybe it's appropriate to really cut the carbs. And, you know, go low carb. Um, I use that in a general term because, again, this is individualized and maybe you don't need to be at 50 grams of total carbs every day. But on the other hand, maybe you need to be at 20 or less. You know, it's really going to depend on what your, your situation on, is. Yeah, and on your markers. All right, last question. We're a little bit over time, but we will let you go to bed. It must be one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 
<laughs> Last question. I've started getting gout after taking a statin. Will this make my gout worse? Hmm. I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I can't, I can't give you an answer about that, but, um, and I don't, I'm not a medical doctor, uh, so I can't really comment about the issue of the statin per se. The one thing I would suggest is to, um, is to really look at the, at the literature um, underneath the medical establishment's argument for the statin and address whether you really have that need or not um, based on the risks. And I don't know, maybe Susan has an opinion about this too. Yeah, well, I think you really need to look at your underlying factors for a start. Uh, if you've been given a statin, it will be because your cholesterol is outside of reference ranges. And that is a topic that is really up for debate. I think you need to be looking more at your blood sugars, your insulin, your whole metabolic health. And you need to be looking at your triglycerides and your blood pressure and really doing all the things you can do to get that down. And, you know, once again, we're not offering medical advice here, but I would, that if it was me, that's what I would be looking at doing. I'd be looking at reducing all those markers, all those risk factors that were the need for a statin in the first place. And, and then I also think you should go to the literature and have a look at the negative effects of statins because they are not minor. Um, Dr. Martin, uh, Dr. Malcolm Kendrick just wrote a book called The Clot Thickens, but he's also written a book about a statin nation. And I think that would be, oh, there we go, The Clot Thickens. So that's well worth reading. And a statin nation is really well worth reading. And that really goes through in detail the the background to statins, the pharmaceutical companies, and whether they are whether they are needed, which is nobody saying that you shouldn't take one, and there's probably occasions when they are warranted, but I'd be looking at it quite carefully. And we do know that they cause muscle pain. Um, that's really well documented. So whether they would cause a gout flare up, oh, I'm not qualified to answer that, but. That would, no, be, right. that would be oh, my no. thought on statins and cholesterol. Deal with all the underlying metabolic issues first. Very informative. Thanks to you both. All right, well, we better let you go off to bed, um, Dr. Pete, but thank you so much for coming tonight and um, participating in this. It's been a really valuable discussion. Thank you. Uh, I I'm very honored to, to be here and really appreciate it.